Hey guys, and welcome back to Dan's Pro Shop. It is morning, morning, morning. It is, oh boy, 3.12 a.m. Uh, today is the first Monday of the month. It's not that for you right now, but trust me, it is for me right now. And the first Monday of the month, there's a little more going on here during startup for the plant. You know, uh, changing filters and just uh, greasing things and oil changes and scheduled preventative maintenance stuff that happens once a month that just happens on the first Monday of the month, which happens to be today. So uh, you guys are interested, hang around and see how that goes on. And we'll see you guys out in the shop. Well guys, here we are in ye old mechanical room. I've done some clips in here before. You may have seen it, you may not have. But here we have our chilling unit and here we have our water tower and some air compressors and stuff behind you. Actually, I just did a pretty decent repair on the chiller here and uh, I don't think that video has come out yet, but pay mind, that's gonna be out, I promise. But right now, since the first Monday of the month and everything, doing preventative, See this guy right here? This is an uh, like off the main line filter. So it doesn't really take all of the volume of it, but it's like a side stream here. We have one on the tower and one on the chiller. It's one of those cartridge, like just take it out, throw it away sock filters. So uh, yeah, that's just one of the things that needs to be done, especially on the tower, because if you guys know anything about water towers, the thing is outside. Well half of what you see is outside and it works on evaporative cooling meaning that these big giant pumps push all this water outside it drops through this giant fiberglass tower and then this huge like airplane prop sucks air through it and through doing that and the water cascading through the whole thing and everything it actually cools the water just by using air and then it comes back in here, gets circulated through the plant and everything. It actually cools the water chiller because this is how like the condenser works on this thing. It's not air cooled, it's water cooled. So this thing is super important and keeping that water clean is just as important as keeping it cool. So uh, I know I'm rambling here. Let's do the filter. So the first thing in this process here, you see I have a two inch ball valve here. We shut that off because this goes into the tank. And if you drain this while this is open, it will siphon the tank out and it just makes a bloody mess. I mean, there's already a mess here anyway, but this helps to mitigate that. So underneath here, got a half inch ball valve that helps drain this thing out. I mean, eh, it kind of works, but it clogs up so much because of how dirty this process is. And then this guy here, this is a two inch off of the main eight inch supply that goes out to the plant. So you see here, Oh boy, this is just uh, I don't know, the housing or whatever you want to call it for the cartridge filter. Now this thing's going to puke on me because it always does. Yeah. Unfortunately, there's really no good way around this. We're in the mechanical room. There's floor drains all over the place. It's just a concrete floor. It ain't gonna hurt nothing. But either way, you gotta do it. Oh, yeah, that's yummy. So here's a little bit better look at what's going on. This is the inlet pipe as uh, described by this handy label here. The water comes in, goes through a sock filter, and then through a stainless steel screen, and then out the other side here into the discharge pipe that goes back into the tank. So, see there? We got a filter sock inside of a screen. Uh, some people say you can use one or the other. It's just, uh, I've always used both and it works. I mean. Look at all the crap this thing catches and keeps it from going back into the pump. 
So not only foreign material, but also the dust and all the crap that comes from the air outside in that cooling tower. So we simply just yank this thing out of here. Now, ugh. yeah, that's nice. You see all that crud? Yeah, we're keeping all of that out of the pumps of the tower and let alone all the heat exchangers on the machines and specifically the chiller. That thing is a temperamental old girl and everything we can do to make her life better in turn makes our life better. So this little preventative crap is well worth it. Oh, we got here some brandy new sock element filters. And just like an oil filter or an air filter or whatever, these things come in different micron ratings. Micron meaning the space in between like the threads of the fabric here or the filter element and how big of a particulate you will allow through it. So let's take our stainless steel screen, shove her back in there, get our uh, fancy half inch EMT uh, shoving pipe here. Make sure that filter's down in there all the way and below the inlet pipe. Everything's good to go. Let me seal her back up. I know you guys are probably thinking the top of this thing is real gross and disgusting and everything. Well, half of that's grease. It's not as bad as it looks because parts of this thing are just regular carbon steel and good me, does this thing rust like you wouldn't believe. I grease up the lid of this thing to try and help it from not self-destructing as fast. Now we've got to remember, shut off the drain on the bottom and turn this drain back on to allow everything to do its thing. Now we're going to do this exact same thing over there on the tower. There, chiller. Yeah, that, man, I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Now, I know I'm probably going to be standing in the way for most of this one here, but you guys just saw what I did over there. So it's about the same thing. The outlet pipe goes into this tank here and there has a valve on it to keep it from uh, siphoning while I have this thing open. Open up the drain on the bottom. Oh, Jiminy. I don't know what schmuck put these things on here last. <laughs> Me. Uh. But yeah, that's another reason for greasing the lid. Never fails. These things get tighter and thin here. All right. Now this one is always significantly cleaner because this one doesn't go outside. This is more or less a closed loop system. It's not completely closed because the lid of this tank here opens, so it's not like pressurized, but uh, significantly cleaner. There's very few foreign particulate to get into this system. Yeah, you can tell just by the ease there that this one's significantly simpler to do and nowhere near as dirty. Make sure we take our tag off here so we have it for inventory and we got a part number to order more. Shove our new sock in there. Make sure it's below the pipe. Put our cap back on. I'm trying not to go nuts so I don't uh, screw myself again next time. Well, that's, I probably did, let's be honest. Open the outlet back open, close the bottom one, <laughs> that's it for filter change. Now this is a good one that I'm sure that you guys probably can't see, but this thing right here is an automated drain on the water tower. So for an X amount of time, 
every X amount of time, let's just say for one minute every hour, this thing opens and allows water to drain out of the tower. And during that process, the computer behind you, I'll show you, <coughs> monitors like the pH level and bacteria and additive and all that stuff in this water. But there is a filter in line before this automated valve here. And it is super important to keep this thing clean because if this valve jams up or doesn't work, the whole thing doesn't work. So nothing fancy about this, it's just a little plastic and stainless steel mesh screen. And uh, yeah, that's pretty good. So make sure that we have our orientation correct in the cap back in line there and then we make sure we turn that back on now i'll show you guys the computer behind you that i was talking about so guys this is what i'm talking about we have a bias side and we have a chemical that treat the water inside of this tower since most of it is outside like i've been preaching here it's very susceptible to bacteria and like algae growth and all that stuff just like a swimming pool so we need to take care of it so this guy here is a controller that hooks up to that pump and this pump. So they monitor through that filter and valve everything over there, what's going on with the water inside of this tank. And if and when it needs anything, this thing turns on and puts so many pumps of either of these into that tank and maintains a good level of like pH and like antibacteria and all that stuff. I think there's even like anti-foaming stuff in here. So the, the, like, uh, the bubbling effect of the impeller doesn't really make this thing into foam. Now we have all the filters changed and the filters cleaned. The last thing we have to do here is uh, prep this guy for power up. So we have the main disconnect here. Yeah, look away from it, one arm. I know I preach the right hand thing, but uh, for this confinement, you can't do it one handed. Anyway, now we have this thing powered up. We can turn on some pumps. So this is the process pump that takes everything from the ball tank out into the plant and back. Do that one first. This one is for the tower pump. It takes everything from the bulk tank, pumps it through that tower outside with the fan, and then back into the tank. Different switch for every circuit so we can work on everything. The next switch down here is for the actual tower fan to command that on. And this bottom one is simply for an alarm that goes out into the plant. So if I have something wrong, if a pump shuts off or if the temperature gets too high, it alarms outside so I know to get my butt in here and see what's going on. See that? We're on right now because the system is building pressure. Once it gets to like 50 PSI, this will shut off. And if you guys can tell here, you see we got three motors, but you only heard me talk about two. That big one in the middle is a standby pump. In the event one of these two main pumps fail, I have the ability to change the valves in this manifold and utilize that center pump to replace one of the end two while I'm fixing it, replacing it, repairing it, whatever. This is a really good redundancy system because of how important this thing is. We can't afford for it not to run. If this thing doesn't run, the whole plant doesn't run. It's an integral piece of equipment and we need to make sure this thing is usable as much as possible. So guys, if you remember, like I said, the tower is responsible for cooling the chiller. That thing acts just like the condenser on the air conditioner in your house. It's super important. This thing will overheat if that's not working correctly or it's not on period. So there is a procedure to doing this. You have to turn on that tower first and then come over here and do the chiller. This thing is all run by a PLC. Everything's good to go in programming. So whenever we turn this thing on, it's really simple. Just hit the start button. Now you guys will notice maybe here it, I don't know, everything is coming on in order. The two process pumps, the two circulation pumps. Once everything is running and the PLC sees that we have flow in each circuit, it will then kick on the compressors and start chilling the water. And there we go. I don't know if you guys heard that. Circuit number two. 
just kicked on. The way this thing is programmed in the PLC, the compressors share the load. So one will come on, this one will come on, back and forth. Unless there's a really heavy load on the system, then both will run at the same time in order to bring us back down to our set temperature. And one of the last things that we have to do in here, fire up our compressed air system. This is kind of like our backup air compressor now because we got a brand new fancy 50 horsepower one right behind you. But I turn this one on simply by hitting the on button. I let this run first thing on Monday morning and charge the air system in the plant. That gives this thing a little bit of a workout because you know sitting idle isn't good for anything. Just like if you have an old classic car sitting in the garage, the worst thing you can do is not drive it because it just literally falls apart. That thing needs to be worked to be used. So this thing is set 5 PSI lower than the main air compressor. So this thing really only kicks on whenever it needs help to supply that 150 PSI to the plant. So if we're not using all that air, this one really doesn't turn on. Yes, it gets used, but like I said, for a backup, for a supplemental air supply. So now that we have this thing on, I'm gonna shake out some filters and turn over and do the same thing right behind you. So really, the last thing to do for this compressor here is uh, we blow out the condenser here. So this is what's responsible for cooling the refrigerant, both for the drying circuit and the oil for the compressor. It's just like your car, it's a giant radiator. It sucks in ambient air and cools down the internal components. There's also a fan and a radiator over there specifically for the refrigerant on the condenser. But uh, yeah, they, they kind of all work together. But either way, gotta let this thing build up a little bit of air to help clean itself. But you guys will see, man, there is just a plume of like napalm and dust in the other, it's, you'll see. There's also some filters here on the electrical cabinets that get really gross. Because these fans run all the time regardless of temperature. And these just help keep the internals cool inside the electrical cabinet. Now we'll go on to the big one. That one's always really gross. So it's the same thing over here, really. We just hit the on button, this thing fires up. Over here, we have radiator for the condenser. All that, to, you know, for the air dryer. It works pretty much just like an air conditioner, but that's what draws the moisture out of the air. So there's a radiator over here. I'm just gonna wait a second for this to kick on. There we go. Now, wait till you see what comes out of this thing. Yummy. And bear in mind, guys, this blowing out the air compressors, I do this every Monday. This isn't just a once a month thing. So this is only one week's worth of crap. And we're inside. So what does that tell you the CFM these things move? Just every little thing that could possibly be in the air, these things collect. And well, this is what you get. Just like the little one over there. We have filters for the electrical cabinet. Every so often these just get replaced instead of blowed out, but uh, for the most part you can reuse them. Now here's the big radiator.
All right. Now, in case you guys are freaking out about air quality, honestly, it looks worse than what it is. There is a giant exhaust fan in the ceiling of this room to help me get this crud out of here. Unfortunately, this is just a necessary evil. This stuff has to be done because these things are expensive and temperamental. So if we don't keep them clean, keep them cool, and keep them operating, there's nothing but problems in here. I honestly think there's really only one last step in here other than greasing, but we do that all at once. It's behind the small air compressor, I have wired up an alarm that goes outside just like the tower to let me know if there's something wrong with the air circuit. If we drop below a certain PSI, that thing turns on a light and a buzzer outside so I know to come in here and check out what's going on. So we just gotta plug that in. Looky there, a plug aptly named air pressure alarm. We just plug that in and that thing runs off of a pressure regulator over here on the bulk tank and that's what turns on and off the alarm. I'll show you. So that thing right there connected to the bulk tank right after that gauge is just a electric switch that turns on a contact. If this thing drops below 90 PSI, that thing turns on and activates a switch to put an alarm and a buzzer out on the other side of the wall there. <coughs> All right. Now that we have that pretty much all done, except for the grease and like I said, and I'm sorry for screaming the whole time. I, I'm half deaf as it is. I don't know if I'm actually yelling or, either way, we're out of there for now. The only thing left to do is put a couple pumps of grease and the motors in there, and uh, that's about it. On to the next thing. And then he said, let there be light. We'll do that about a thousand more times. Do the same thing in here. Back here we have a super important machine that needs to be turned on super early so everything has time to heat up and warm up. In case you're wondering, this machine makes everlasting gobstoppers. So I can't show you the process at all. It's like super top double secret. Double secret probation. Double secret probation, sir? Either way, doesn't matter what we're making, this thing needs temperature controlled water. So that's what I'm doing right now. I'm simply turning on the temperature water regulator controller thing. We got some more lights here. In all seriousness, guys, I know I'm kind of being a jag off about the gob stopper thing, but there is a lot of proprietary stuff in here that's either like customer owned or like it's our own thing and I can't really put it out there. So. A lot of you guys have mentioned that you would like to see more of me like in the plant doing work and not so much tabletop bench based stuff. Well, it's difficult because there's only so much that I can actually put on film. So uh, I don't know, I guess I have to be delicate with what I can show you guys so I can really only show you what I can show you. I digress. On to the next. So guys, welcome to the Vac Shack. I don't know if you have caught any of my stuff in the past, but for our material conveyance system. So let me break this down to you real quick here. In the plastics industry, we use virgin material and regrind, and 90% of it is pelletized. It looks like, I don't know, like durable food or something. I don't know, wee little pellets like BBs. There you go, like an Aerosoft BB. It looks like that, and we need a way to get it from A to B, whether it be the giant silo outside or cardboard boxes or gate lords or whatever, however we get this stuff, we need to get it from where it is to the machine. And the most efficient and best and cleanest way to do that is via vacuum. So there is a giant spider web of plumbing in the ceiling with two inch extruded aluminum pipe that feed all of the machines and they all get connected with hoses and pipes and this and that. But this guy right here is the heart of that system. This is pretty much like a roots blower that you would see on top of a, like a V8 or something. Well, you know, with any pump, if there's positive pressure, there's negative pressure, it has to come from one end or the other. So in this, for instance, we're not pumping air into something, we're pulling air out of something. 
So we have the intake filter on the suction, suction side of this pump. And then we have here, this thing is actually called a crunkle valve. Yeah, I know it's either way. This is like a reverse waste gate. So if you guys are familiar with turbos, whenever you build so much manifold pressure, it like lets off. So you don't blow the thing apart. This is exactly the same in reverse that there is a valve or like a diaphragm in here on a certain set spring tension. Then whenever this thing pulls so much vacuum, this will actually release and allow some atmosphere in here. So this thing doesn't pull so much vacuum that it starts to hurt itself. But uh, yeah, super simple. This is a blower, just like you would see on top of an engine. It has a pulley and it's attached to an electric motor and that's it. It's all controlled, PLC driven. So we can control which machine does what and all that. Uh, I know I'm preaching here, but either way, this guy right here is like the main defense for dust and this kind of crud. Because regrind is a really dirty material, it's just inherently dusty. It's like sawdust. It's, it's gross. It gets absolutely everywhere and it's almost impossible to contain it. So we have this giant cartridge filter thing here. So this is the main suction line for everything in the plant. Anytime a vacuum is produced, it comes through this pipe. But to get to the pump, it has to come through this pipe, through this filter first. So everything comes into this filter, gets cleaned. The particulate and everything drop down in the tank below, so we can dispose of it later. And then it goes from there into the intake filter on the pump, and then recirculated, yada, yada, yada. In case you guys are wondering, this guy right here, this is just another like reverse wastegate, but this one is controlled by the PLC. So we can really monitor the HG, like the inches of vacuum in the system. So if I want more, if I want less or whatever, this is just a pneumatic piston that opens and closes a valve on the side of the suction line. So we can monitor the ideal state of vacuum in that system when it's operating. But one of the biggest things, this is also done every week. This isn't just a first Monday thing. This filter, depending on what we're using, what kind of material we're running and everything, this filter gets just ungodly dirty. Unfortunately, it's just like the air compressors. It is what it is. There's really no way around it. The best we can do is try to mitigate how bad it is. So I take this thing out here, take that tank off, throw, throw it in a garbage can, take the filter off, go blow it out. And you'll see, we'll get over there. Now there is absolutely nothing glorious about this task. It's just dirty, dusty, cruddy. You know, this is usually something you have the apprentice do. But unfortunately I'm on my lonesome today. So like I said, filter. This is pretty much, actually I think I got this from CarQuest or Napa or something. This is like a, an intake filter for like an international or something. I don't know, but uh, basically just an air filter. That's all there is to it. And we'll blow this out in a minute. Same thing like the air compressor filters. Yes, you could replace it every time, but mercy me, does that get expensive? I mean, I know I'm not the one cutting the checks, but you know, you help the place that helps you, it's cohesive, I, whatever. So you can get away with cleaning these. I don't know, about maybe every two or three months or so we replace that. But in between, it's perfectly sufficient just to get in there with an air gun and clean it out. Either way, so now we have this thing. It's honestly not that bad. There's only a couple inches of gunk in there. But the tank on the bottom here, this thing works just like a dust collector if you're a, a woodworker. So the vac vacuum pulls in this entire canister. It beats up against that filter and all the particulate that's too big to go through the filter, gravity takes over and falls down in here. Huh. Like I said, not that bad today. I'll take it. Now this thing doesn't have to be pristine clean. It just has to be pretty much empty. And this filter has to be relatively clean so the whole thing works well. But uh, yeah, you get the point. You guys see here? 
we need air to complete this project. So uh, starting up the plant in the way that I do by going in the mechanical room first, there's a reason for this. I need water over there. I needed air over here. The vacuum system runs on pneumatics. It's just after you do this for almost 10 years, you, you figure this stuff out. It's, you know what I mean. All right. That's about as good as a used cobalt right there. Put all that crap back in there. Put the lid back on, clamp her down. Go reinstall this thing into the circuit. And then there's only one thing left to do in there. Thank goodness for our trusty old Leatherman, huh? This thing can do anything. Well, now that we have our filtration taken care of, the last thing we have to do is a physical oil change on our roots blower. This just takes regular SAE 30 weight oil. And it's a simple drain and fill. There's not much to it. So uh, yeah, let's just do that. So you guys see here, I've done my best to try to make this easy on myself throughout the years. And I put a couple stainless steel quarter turn valves here on this case. So obviously the lower one is the drain and the top one is the fill port. So if you guys are familiar with like crank cases or like axles or transfer cases or PTOs or whatever, any kind of gearbox, there would be two holes there, one to drain, and then there's one to check for full. That's simply what these are here. And then the fill is actually on top. But like I said, super simple here. It's just regular. I think I got like, I don't know, castor oil sae 30 or something just regular 30 weight motor oil just something to keep the bearings inside of here alive for as long as we can because let me tell you this thing hums when she's running oh -hoo, i lied we got fram yeah i don't know honestly we're just we're right next door to an advanced auto parts so uh, whenever i go over there and ask the guy for just sae 30 after the dude looks at me like I have four heads and he thinks I'm working on an old Oliver tractor or something, just, hey guy, give me what I'm asking for. Your make model doesn't matter. I need 30 weight. So now that this thing's about done, I'll just close that up. Throw all that good stuff right down our gullet there. And we simply just wait for it to come out of this top one. And then I know that our level's full. Look at that. It's just, just a little gulp. This thing doesn't take much. Do a little more just for good measure. We'll let that top one drain until it's just dribbling out. Yeah, honestly, right about there. And that lets me know that the case is uh, sufficiently full. Reinstall our fill plug there. And I know even though I have ball valves here, I put pipe plugs in the end of them. Not only for a little bit of insurance, but to keep stuff out of there too. Bugs, dust, whatever. Honestly, for that little bit, it can't hurt. Now guys, you like my uh, PM schedule here? You can tell uh, I've had this particular list since uh, December of 2017. But this is just a good way so not only I can keep track of it, but anybody else can come in here and be like, hey, look, the oil was changed on this thing on 10, what is it? I don't know. Ah. 10-2. 23. So anyone that comes in and looks at this thing, besides myself, just automatically knows the oil change was done October 2nd, 23. Now, last thing on here is we just take a gander at this intake filter. This one is rarely an issue because of this guy, but uh, it doesn't hurt to look at it. And honestly, this thing still looks brand new. Yeah, there's some stuff in there, but it's really not bad at all. And honestly, I replaced this not all that long ago anyway. 
So we're going to call that one good. So just like the pumps and motors and everything over there in the chiller room, this thing also gets greased. But like I said, we go around and do that all at one time. We get the gun and just go ahead and hit all the motors. Oh, and in case you guys are wondering what this pile of crud is right here, I just recently did a repair on this thing because it was plugged up. Because, you know, I don't know, you get 90 degree turns in here and this and that, and I had a valve malfunction. Either way, this was just from me, and honestly, shame on me being lazy. I didn't clean up after myself. But yeah, that's what all this crap is. Down here in the material storage, you got to make sure all of our blenders are on and running. Oh, I mentioned Gaylord earlier, in case you guys think that's a funny word. Well, it is. This is a Gaylord. It's basically like, uh, I don't know, like a four by four by three, just giant cardboard box that sits on top of a pallet. And it's for bulk material transit. I don't know why they're called that, just they are. But in case you're wondering, this is a Gaylord. There we go. We got our blenders running. Let's turn on some lights. Sweet. Now, the majority of what needs to be done in here is pretty well done. What happens after this is pretty much just like a regular Monday starting the plant. We go around, turn on machines, heat up barrels, get motors running, get pumps running, get hydraulic oil running around. Everybody's excited to go to work on Monday. But uh, yeah, the really what needs to happen for the rest of my first Monday is outside stuff like uh, air conditioners and filters and physically checking that water tower outside, which got a little treat for you. We got a new way to look at that thing. But uh, yeah, either way, that's really what goes on next. Right here is the control station for the, all that vacuum stuff that we just did. You see all this fancy stuff on the screen here? This indicates all the different machines in the plant. So anything that needs deliverable material is all controlled by this thing. So we just simply have to turn it on and ready the system. So guys, as I was walking past, I realized that I totally forgot to show you the alarms out here that I told you I was going to show you. Starting from left to right. We have the air compressor, the chiller, and the tower. And they are just audible and visual alarms. So in the event that anything were to go wrong with any three of those systems in that room, be it an unacceptable temperature range, high or low, unacceptable pressure, high or low, or just a plain old malfunction. And let's be honest, just if something quit working, it would affect one of those two things either way, right? But either way, those things will come on and they are loud and they are bright and it's a strobe and this and that and anywhere in the plants because of how tall those are you can pretty much see those so if you see any one of those three lights or hear any one of those three sirens you know something's going bad and because of how integral everything is in that room to operating this building it's important no matter what you're doing you drop what you're doing and get in there and see what's going on if one of those lights are on and honestly guys the rest of interior startup here is we simply just turn on the barrel heats and the motors for the machines. Let these things uh, warm up and get ready to do their job. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I think it's time for some coffee. But like I said, this is only half of what's going on here. Well, more than half anyway. But we need to get outside later on whenever I can see what I'm doing out there. And uh, we're going to check out the tower and uh, the air conditioning condensers and do filters and all that in there. So, see you guys outside. Well, guys, here we are outside at the cooling tower. This is the exterior of that big giant pump and everything that you guys saw inside. If you can tell here, this is just a giant fiberglass tub. And it's got a bunch of media inside of it. Honestly, it's just like plastic baffles. The water gets pumped in at the very top of this thing and then it cascades down through those baffles, gets collected in this bottom basin and then goes back inside through that giant 8 inch PVC right there with the shutoff valve. 
The whole reason for that valve there is so whenever we tear this thing apart and clean it every now and again, we're able to shut off this thing and segregate it from the inside so all that particulate and crap doesn't go back into the tank of the inside. But uh, if you guys can see way, way up on top there, there's kind of like a funnel shape. That's where the big giant pump and that fan blade, that propeller, that turns on and sucks air in through the vents on the side of this thing and then out through the top. So the air is getting sucked up, the water is falling down, and through the process of that happening, we get evaporative cooling. And usually we're able to achieve somewhere between like eight and 10 degrees Fahrenheit lower than ambient air temperature. So honestly, anything we can get is good. And for how much that chiller uses energy, we really need to supply that thing with cool water to make it run efficiently. But I told you guys you were in for a treat. Now, let's get up there and see what the top of this thing looks like. Here we go, guys. Check this out, we're in the air. Look at the smile on that guy's face. I can just tell you how cool this thing is. And here we are, we're in the air. We're on the roof of the plant, taking a gander at everything from upstairs. Now here is the top of the cooling tower, like I was explaining. There's that big giant 20 horse electric motor attached to that big fan blade that's responsible for moving the air through that thing and creating the cooling. Now I'm doing the best I can to try to keep this thing hovering here, but that fan moves so much air that it's really difficult to get any closer than what this is. The turbulence is just nuts over top of that thing. And here you can see the vents that the air gets sucked in through the bottom and out through the top. Now we're on top of the plant here. You guys can see the four large air conditioning units up here. And that's what I was talking about changing the filters. And over here is my pride and joy. We hung old glory up on top of the material silo. And I just love it, that's a good view. Now we're gonna spin around head back over the plant and get a different angle of the cooling tower. Now I'm a little bit higher here so you can get a better shot down into it and you can see all that material that the water goes through and kind of gets that cascade effect and has the ability to actually slow down and cool as it's falling. Now here's just a better shot of the plumbing going back into the plant and uh, just a nice pick of the legs and everything, how it's anchored to the ground. And I figured since we're up here, why not get a little piece of the beauty of Western Pennsylvania? We're lucky enough that here at the plant, we are right next to a field. You know, there's always all kinds of stuff growing in this field. There's corn, there is alfalfa, there's anything and everything, anything soybeans, but it's really cool because we actually get a lot of wildlife out here in the plant. You know, there's groundhogs, sometimes deer. It's just, it's awesome that we are rural enough to get that kind of stuff, even being this close to Pittsburgh. Now let's just go ahead, touch this thing down, head on back into the shop and wrap this thing up. Man, guys, how freaking cool is that? We've literally just taken the channel to a new height. We can now film from a drone. This little guy is the Venix V11 personal drone kit. It's got everything you need, obviously the drone, two batteries at 35 minutes each so total of 70 minute flight time before you have to charge up and it comes with a fancy remote that your phone clips into it operates off gps and you know you can set a coordinate for it to just automatically go somewhere you can hit a button on the remote so it comes right back to you you can set parameters and height and distance and speed and dude this thing is so cool now, obviously from the video footage you guys saw that I'm still pretty green at doing this. I'm definitely a novice. But that being said, I've only used this thing a couple times and I'm still able to do it. You can capture video, you can capture photos, anything you wanna do. There's either an SD card right here in the drone or it transfers all that stuff right to your phone, whatever you're using. And this thing is super easy and user friendly. Like you don't have to be good at using one of these to use one right out of the package, you set it up and you go. Literally, you just download the app and it spells everything out for you. It couldn't be any easier. I'll bring you guys in so you can see the kit a little bit better. So first things first, it comes in this nice molded like uh, fabric case. You got all kinds of stuff in here, chargers, cables, it's good for Android or Apple. And it even comes with some spare blades because they anticipate a learning curve with this thing. Like I said, an extra battery, a snazzy remote control, Whenever this thing is powered up, it's like a full dashboard for everything that you need here. It tells you the speed of your drone, the status of your connectivity here, 
the, how far away you are, how high you are, how fast it's going, how fast the propellers are going, your battery on the remote and on the drone. It also monitors your phone whenever it's hooked up in here. So everything is good on one unit. I know I'm rambling on a little bit, of, a little bit of a product plug here, but this thing is freaking awesome. Not to mention it's user accessible. Like these things aren't millions of dollars anymore. And you guys saw the video, it's 1080p that streams live to your phone from a freaking airplane. Like how cool is this? I think this one has a range of like a mile. So it's just unreal the stuff that you can do with this stuff. And you can like set a GPS tracker on your phone. So like if you're on a dirt bike or in a car or something, as long as you have your phone with you on the controller, like you will anyway, this thing will follow you. And you can just get the coolest aerial footage of stuff that you never even thought of before. And I just think this is absolutely awesome. And I know we are gonna do some cool stuff on the channel with this thing once I get better at it but the applications are literally endless. So I just thought that that would be a nifty way to involve this thing and get you guys up on the roof there and show you how that tower works. Now I know the video may not have done it justice because of the frame rate of the camera and everything, but let me tell you, man, whenever that fan spools up, that thing is moving. It's, it's like I said, it looks weird on the video, but that thing moves some air. It's super cool how that works. And it's like awesome in its simplicity. You know, water falls down, air goes up, and the result is a cooler water in the bottom. It's just a really big integral part of the plant. And checking the health of that thing and making sure it all works is a big part. And honestly, now that I have this thing, I don't need to get up there anymore because I can see it from the ground. It's safe two feet on the ground. So not only is this a fun, cool thing to use, but it's a tool. Now you can get in places where you couldn't before, like you needed a man lift or a scaffold or something. You have the ability to take photos and pictures of places that you couldn't be before. Now I know I told you guys that we were gonna do the air conditioning filters up there, but honestly, I mean, it's just like your furnace filter at your house. It's a cardboard filter you take out, you replace. I mean, there's a lot more of them and they're a lot bigger, but whatever. You guys saw the four large carrier units up there on the roof. And that's all it is. I just gotta get my butt up there and change those filters every month. At least I try every month. I mean, in the winter, whenever there's a foot of snow up there, it doesn't really happen. But during the summer months when those things are working, I really try to keep on top of it. Well, there you have it, guys. Uh, preventative maintenance first Monday of the month in a nutshell. I know this one's getting a little long-winded here, but a lot of you have actually commented and said that you like the longer stuff. So, Bob's your uncle, here you have it. And in case you guys are interested, in this Venix drone, be sure to check out the link in the description to see this thing, go to the website, check out the reviews. Yeah, I mean, don't take my word for it. The internet's a big place. Do your research, figure out if this thing is right for you. But like I said, these things are actually reasonable now. They're within the reach of the normal fella. And if you're into this kind of stuff, like, hey man, if you're a YouTuber, or even if you just, you're an adventurous little fella, and you want to get out there and see stuff that you couldn't see before. It's just super nifty. And like I mentioned, if you do stuff like this, there's even kind of that safety slash use it as a tool aspect. It's just super cool. And I know I'm going to use the crap out of this thing, hopefully get better at it and get you guys some better footage in the process. So thanks for hanging around with me today, guys, and we will see you next time.